Welcome to the Leaders of Tomorrow show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Our guest today is Mr. Andre Polgar. Andre is an economist, an investor, and a best-selling author who is based in Romania. So he'll have a very interesting perspective on what is going on from outside the United States. Andre is also the host of One Minute Economics, where he covers everything from global politics to cryptocurrencies. So today we are going to cover it all. Andre, welcome to the show. How are you today? Thank you very much for having me, Michelle. A little recovering after a cold, but overall feeling pretty good. Thank you, everyone, for watching. <laughs> Aren't we all recovering from a cold? Andre, it's so great to have you here. It's going to be very interesting to get your point of view, again, from outside our country. So let's start off with global politics. You've spoken for a while about the topic of an impending economic collapse. And this subject is, of course, very widespread. Many economists have it at the top of their discussion list. But you have expressed a very unique perspective on this scenario. Break it down for us. What is the big picture that you are watching from Romania? Right off the bat, I think the mistake made by many economists is that they focus too much on the when dimension, despite the fact that it's not really the elephant in the room. In uh, my previous book, The Age of Anomaly, I have made it clear that um, not only are we dealing with one real estate bubble or one tech bubble like we had back in the day or any one asset related bubble, in my view, we are Therefore, in an age of anomaly, we are dealing with many individual bubbles, which in and of, it, in and of themselves are perfectly able to bring down uh, an economic system that's essentially quite fragile, definitely more so than people expect. And all of this combined is essentially one mega bubble, if you want to call it that. Because, of course, uh, what I think is important for people to understand is globally speaking, not just in the US, not just in Europe, but everywhere. If there's one thing politicians don't want to do, it's for things to go sour on their watch. So essentially, it's always going to be a Herculean effort on their part to roll it over, roll it over again. And as we've seen, we can take just two steps back. And you know, you had Ellen Greenspan in charge of the Fed over, over in the US and the dot com bubble. Obviously, nobody wanted that to have dramatic effects, so interest rates were lowered. That facilitated an even bigger bubble, a real estate bubble over the, in the U.S., the same thing over and over and over again, because nobody wants to assume the political responsibility and backlash, which would come from essentially a systemic reset. So obviously, globally speaking, everyone's going to try to make this bubble last as long as possible so that it ends on someone else's watch. And what we ultimately end up dealing with is anomaly as status quo, like I, wanna, like I oftentimes choose to refer to it. Anomaly as uh, status quo in that a general public that has grown more and more accustomed to the unorthodox ends up accepting just that as status quo. In other words, 1913, when the third central bank of the U.S. appeared, the Federal Reserve. From then up until the Great Recession, roughly 800 or so billion dollars had existed in the monetary system. At the height of QE over in the U.S., they pumped 85 billion per month into the system, approximately a trillion per year, more so in one year than had existed from 1913 up until the Great Recession. Over here in the European Union, if we uh, take the height of our QE and, and transform it into dollars, we're dealing with even more. Over here in Europe, not only um, did we end up dealing with very low interest rates, they went in negative territory, the same in Japan. The thing is, um, that's why I start my book with a chapter called Outsmarted by Frogs, where I tell people that, you know, the idea that you can slow cook a frog and it won't notice, that's a myth, actually. The frog will notice, but we don't. That's why I like to say to people that in this respect, we have been outsmarted by frogs in that systematically one small step at a time, one concession at a time, one extraordinary measure at a time, we have come 
to accept the unsustainable as status quo. Fast forward to the present, and we find ourselves in a system where we have bubble after bubble after bubble coexisting with economists left and right risking their careers to say, hey, wait a second, it's going to end next month. It's going to end two months from now. But as everyone in the investing world knows, the market can remain irrational for longer than you can stay solvent. So in the age of anomaly, through my work on the YouTube channel, I try to be old school in this respect and tell people it doesn't matter as much when this is going to unfold. What matters most is understanding the situation we're dealing with and taking active measures to protect yourself today. If you do that, you no longer care as much that it's going to pop next month or next year or two months from now, because when it does, you'll be well positioned to land on your feet. And I think that's enough. Exactly. You bring up several really good points. Um, the first one being that nobody wants to address this on their watch. You know, these, these major problems, these major over here in the United States, the medical costs and things like that, they just keep pushing it to administration, to administration, to administration, and it keeps growing and growing and growing. So people are used to, hey, this is just a way an economy runs, and it absolutely doesn't. Um, Andre, I want you to expound a little bit more on the interconnectedness of today's global economy. You mentioned it. And from here inside the United States, we tend to feel very insulated from other countries. But in actuality, the economic problems from other countries usually impact everybody across the world. And this is something that is unique to this period of time. Please talk about the specific factors that are involved. As someone from Eastern Europe, I, I may be a, indeed a bit better positioned to understand the interconnectedness of it all. An interconnectedness that oftentimes leads to, of course, anomalies or things that don't necessarily seem logical but occur nonetheless. For example, we have the Great Recession over in the United States, the underlying cause, the real estate situation, the infamous mortgage-backed securities, yada, yada, yada. Fast forward to what actually happened, and the U.S. financial system risked grinding to a halt. But guess what? Strangely enough, a country that, or, that had its origins in uh, uh, a calamity that had its origins in the United States ended up impacting everyone else even more so because the United States in our case, is a safe haven jurisdiction. So what did people do when they became frightened about their financial futures? Obviously, nobody was in a rush to keep money invested in Romania, for example. And as such, they took money from risk-on jurisdictions where they park money when everything seems to be just peachy, and they moved them to safe haven assets like you know, US government bonds and things of that nature. In the end, we draw the line, and over here in my country, we had double-digit wage cuts in the public sector. We, at one point, even had a situation where the pension system was at risk, and there was, uh, were talks about doing the same to the pension system. Or, to put it differently, it's very easy for the, the financial system as a whole, and especially weaker nations, to catch a cold when a strong nation manifests itself this way. That is so interesting that what happened here in the United States impacted Romania that way without Romania doing a thing. It's almost like Romania was hit harder because the United States is so much I, 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 I wouldn't say that per se because I, I usually uh, avoid saying, uh, avoid, I don't know, labeling an individual country or a person as some kind of a victim. No, Romania has its own problems when it comes to the unsustainable nature of our public expenditures, especially in light of the fact that people have, have moved to other countries en masse uh, over the past years and all that gave birth to a really shaky system. What I am saying, however, is that everywhere worldwide, whether we're talking about Eastern Europe or whether we're talking about any other jurisdiction, the underlying system Despite the fact that you see analysts, of course, on TV just telling everyone how sustainable and how robust everything is, despite all that, at its core, the global financial system and the financial system in individual nations, especially weaker ones, is extremely fragile. So, therefore, yeah, whatever happens, 
if there's going to be another crisis in the United States, I know Romania is going to be affected even more so. The same way if there are troubles over in China, it's hard to believe the world will just get a free pass and it's going to be a China-only thing. And once again, we are in this mega bubble situation in which you have, this time when it comes to sovereign nations, you have more than a few individual bubbles, China, the United States, the European Union, you name it, each perfectly capable of bringing down the financial system many times over, all contained within a mega bubble. And it's it, it, it would be interesting to have this, this you know, what's next, what's going to happen? But the truth is, I don't know any other economist who claims to know is just lying to you because this truly is unprecedented due to the scale of things, due to the unprecedentedly interconnected nature of our economies. We have no idea. Right. It's a completely unique period of time. We're in the wild, wild west of the world at the moment, economically speaking. Now, Andre, I want to shift gears just a moment to focus upon the fact that you are from Romania, which is a country in Europe with a fascinating political history, including both communism and socialism. These topics right now are getting a lot of attention here in the United States. Please talk to us about your own personal experience in Romania regarding the effect that this has had upon your own life and your family. Now, when we're talking about countries like mine, Romania in particular, other nations as well, such as Poland, of course, my generation is not old enough to have lived through the communist regime, but we have been brought up by families that have. So essentially, we know all too well the ramifications of it all. And I think a good way to sum it up, as we like to joke here in Romania, is you pretend to pay me and I pretend to work. So in a nutshell, that's the type of thing that sounds very good on paper. It's, a, it's a very appealing, ideologically speaking. But here in Romania and in Poland and other countries like this, due to the fact that in our short-term memory, the follies associated with the system and the monstrous constructions they generate it's still, it's still fresh enough for the population, strangely enough, not to have that much of an appetite for us to do it all over again. Whereas, ironically, many people, especially young people in the West, study after study shows, they see the appeal of communism. Hey, it's politically correct. You get free stuff. Everyone wants free stuff. Ideologically speaking, it's not hard for a charismatic leader or economist or whatever to paint the picture like, you know, Yanis Varoufakis, who used to be the finance minister over in Greece and even prominent econo economists in the U.S. and elsewhere. It's very easy to paint the picture of this appealing system that's fair for everyone and is just one huge free lunch that we can all feast on. However, over here in Eastern Europe, I think the reality of the consequences of such a system is, is fresh enough in our collective memory for us, us to still be somewhat immune to it. What worries me is the trend in the West, however. Yeah, I am worried about that. Communism fell in 1989 here in Romania, and what followed was a government that was essentially meant to be, you know, a facilitator of some kind of a perestroika type system in, uh, in Romania, like they had after the fall of the USSR, which is essentially, hey, we're not those guys anymore. We're a more human version of those guys, but you still don't get democracy. Now, fortunately for Romania, external factors have been in play to such a degree that, no, we did get democracy. Yes, we have had socialism and, you know, it, it, it was definitely a murky times, to put it mildly. Uh, mildly in the 90s but for the most part as of 1981 uh, of 1989 we have transitioned to uh, a democratic system okay now we're members of the eu we are nato members since 2004 so for better or worse we're kind of anchored to the west so to speak so you are anchored to the west right now so do you consider yourself to be capitalists that's a good question. It depends on whom you ask, right? Because obviously there is, there is this kind of battle here in Romania in terms of ideology between uh, nostalgia of older people who talk about how everyone had a job during communism and things like that, and younger people who said, look, you didn't have freedom, look at the numbers, look at how, how you know, uh, primitive the medical system was back then, look at all the manners in which uh, 
in which the country stagnated. There are studies actually which show that countries such as Romania, which have embraced communism after the Iron Curtain was lifted, they have dramatically underperformed countries which were not under communist uh, regimes. And therefore, what we have right now is this kind of battle between nostalgia on the one hand and pra pragmatism and hope with respect to, you know, a capitalist future for Romania on the other. Whereas what we have in the West, comparatively, it tends to be in many cases, you don't have nostalgia about communism there because you cannot have that, but you have there a battle between the, capitalism, the capitalist present and the allure of a system that feels more fair, a system that targets inequality. And again, it's, it's so easy to paint this in a very positive light, which is why it worries me so much in the first place. Talk to us about this, because it's a very important subject and it worries a lot of people over here, too. Um, we have people coming up um, in colleges across the country that are actually um, protesting any speakers that are coming on that are conservative or capitalist in any way, especially the more elite colleges. They're sort of... Um, taking on the speakers and not even letting them speak. They're so ingrained in the idea of the socialist. But yet, Andre, when people ask them questions about, number one, why don't they want, say, Ben Shapiro speaking on their campus, they have no answer for that at all. They have no idea, actually, it seems, who he is. They're just protesting it ferociously and ferociously in favor of socialism. So talk to us about the impact um, from your perspective on the other side of the world, on what's starting to happen here in the U.S.? Well, my best guess as an outsider would be, my best assessment of the situation would be that you have two parties, the left and the right, each digging in deeper in their own trenches, and that people who are capitalists on, on the right are becoming even more uh, aggressive capitalists, as illustrated by the ascension of Donald Trump and the political system and everything that brought about. On the other hand, you have Democrats who have not learned from the Hillary Clinton mistake, and instead you see them pushing candidates who are very much aggressively, let's say, progressive and uh, embracing views of that nature. So what we have, in my view, of course, is a system in the U.S. where each party, instead of finding common denominators, instead of saying, look, we had this divisive election cycle in 2016, let's try to maybe, maybe find some common ground. No. We're seeing the exact opposite. We're seeing everyone adopt their position in an even more ferocious manner. And all of this, because you've mentioned uh, the example with uh, U.S. campuses, all of this is exacerbated by what I like to call influencer culture. Because you have people, and I talk about this in both of my books, you have people on the right who only listen to right-wing pundits. You have people on the left who only listen to left-wing pundits to the extent that the thoughts they end up articulating when, as you've mentioned, people are asking them questions, they're not really their own. They're just regurgitated opinions of the various pundits they subscribe to. And in the end, we have, you know, you live in your bubble, I live in my bubble, I only listen to people who reinforce my current beliefs, you do the same, and good luck trying to find common denominators when it comes to that. And it's not just a U.S. trend. Look at what's happening over in the United Kingdom, look at the various discussions that are taking place throughout the European Union. It's I don't think it's unexpected because, in my opinion, it's all interconnected when you have an unsustainable economic system. You have various frustrations brewing in the system for political reasons, like our discussion now in the, in, in the U.S. And once again, individually, each is a major cause for concern. Collectively, they should make you think that this cannot go on forever. If you ask me to tell you when all of this is going to break, I have no idea. Your guess is as good as mine. But when you have anomalies of such epic proportions, and when you have the unprecedented, the unsustainable, when you have these things all around you, and you're not paying attention, that's on you. Whether it happens next month or next year or two years, I don't really care, neither should you. What you should be caring about is simply doing the best you can as of right now. Right. 
preparation. It's very interesting that one of your books, which you have mentioned, The Age of Anomaly, focuses upon preparing for economic disaster as a direct result of living underneath a communist regime. So apparently your, your family, your grandparents sort of lived in that day-to-day -day preparedness state of mind. Speak to us a little bit about what it was like growing up in Romania under that sort of condition, and what are the best ways for us to prepare? Well, Michelle, in this respect, I think I have an advantage over you, for example, and, and by you, I mean someone from the proverbial West in general, because for better or worse, as someone who grew up in Eastern Europe with everything that brought about, I have at least become accustomed, because I felt it on my own skin, to the fact that the quote-unquote system can fail to the fact that all of these things we take for granted, whether we're talking about warm water, we had a shortage of that when I was growing up, whether we're talking about um, heating, we had a shortage of that when I was growing up. So I promised myself I'd buy a fireplace when I'm older. <laughs> and all of these things, all of these things essentially um, kind of ingrained the idea in my mind, and I believe in the mind of many of my co-nationals, that the system is not foolproof. Why I say that I have an edge in this particular discussion over people from the West is that I, I don't want to be too harsh, but I do strongly feel that the West has become overly spoiled. I think this is the most accurate word to describe the situation. And in both of my books, I've quoted studies like, for example, a relatively recent bank rate studies, which have shown that the average household in the United States, the world's number one economy with a GDP in the 21 niche, the 22 trillions and all of that, the average household would not be able to withstand a mere $500 to $1,000 medical expense or emergency auto repair bill and so on. All of this is happening in a context where we've never had so much time between recessions as right now. So what I'm trying to say is that in the number one economy of the world, you have people essentially living paycheck to paycheck. You have debt-laden individuals who, when times are unprecedentedly good, when it comes to how long it took since the previous recession, and we're still not in a recession right now, and people are still living paycheck to paycheck. So as a bit of a rhetorical question, I believe it's, it, it's worth wondering about what the average Western citizen who has become so overly dependent on the various systems functioning flawlessly, who has become overly dependent on easily obtainable capital and so on, I think it's a question worth asking how these people are going to position themselves when, you know, like Nassim Taleb points it out, when the occasion, when, you know, the, the proverbial black swan event materializes. Mm. Um, I think that might fall into a category that you've spoken of, of improperly educated populations in the fact that um, we're so used to nothing bad happening when, in fact, it was a pattern before and other people prepared, prepared, prepared. Now it hasn't happened for so long that you're right. No one in the United States is prepared. Half of them don't even believe anything bad is going to happen. And the other half of them can't prepare because of the economic situation that they're in. So speak to us about how you would educate populations on situations that they don't really anticipate or believe will be happening. Once again, it's something where I, I, I think I have a unique, as in probably weird, way of doing things compared to other economists in that I'm always the happiest person in the world to embrace my incompetence. And I believe the secret, the key to preparing for the next financial calamity, the next calamity in general, revolves around two things. One, embracing your incompetence and understanding that, no, you cannot predict the future so as to pick the perfect strategy for whichever event you think will unfold. And two, the second key is making financial preparedness, since this is what I specialize in, a constant in your life on the one hand, but on the, on the other hand, not necessarily becoming a hermit and making this dimension dominate your life. I think the key is finding the right balance when it comes to this when it comes to this dimension. And as far as number one is concerned, 
moving forward with the idea of embracing your incompetence and under, of course, you know, obviously if I knew an amazingly devastating deflationary crash would come, I would sell my real estate. I would sell many of my assets. I would hold on. I, I would convert everything I have to cash. And when the crisis comes, I would use my purchasing power that I have when nobody, when nobody else has it to rebuy everything at pennies on the dollar. But I don't know. What if instead we have an inflationary crisis? What if instead we have a deflationary crisis, uh, prices collapsing all over the place, uh, people panicking, asset prices going down, but then as central banks try to pump money into the system and give it more of the same, what if the market eventually says enough is enough? What if the market says, you know what, we don't trust your currency anymore. We don't trust those currencies anymore either. And you go from, deflation, from deflationary so uh, shock to a short-term deflationary scenario environment, but then ultimately sky-high inflation. So again, the key, in my view at least, is not anticipating and simply looking at your personal overall situation. So I, I, I'm going to give you examples with my own finances, right? Like I own real estate. I own real estate in a decent location. I have, uh, you know, income from real estate. It's not, it, it's technically enough to kind of retire on, but it won't be necessarily glorious, but it's there, you know, it's there. So when it comes to this asset class, I'm secured. When it comes to a wide range of other asset classes, I'm covered. So I, if I'm wrong, if I'm making the biggest mistake ever and 50 years are going to go by and we're not going to have a recession, I'm going to be fine because I have a wide range of assets that are going to enable me to prosper just fine. What I am doing, however, personally, is saying to myself, and this is, I think, a train of thought that maybe people are going to find interesting, cash is usually an awful way for you to invest. Holding on to cash, hoarding cash. As Warren Buffett says, you know, the quote him, uh, cash is awful long-term speaking because you know it's going to lose value. But short-term, as the same Warren Buffett says, it's like oxygen. When people don't have it, it's the only thing they do notice. So as an economist, uh, when I think his finger is well placed on the pulse of economic history, I know that cash is a horrible idea long-term speaking. But in this particular context, for my particular situation, in light of the fact that I have adequate exposure to enough assets, my strategy right now revolves around building a solid, solid cash position. This means anything from being more careful with my personal finances and not going on a fancy exotic trip every month to working harder than I usually do, hanging on to more money, trying to make more money in the first place. Again, I'm one of the few economists who focuses on that dimension of, as well, on making more money, on not just trying to conserve, conserve what you already have. And essentially, I believe in finding the right balance for your specific situation so as to put yourself in a scenario where you will probably land on your feet in a wide range of situations. Like in my case, for example, what if my real estate goes to 50%? I'm going to be fine. If it goes to 25%, I'm going to be fine. The same with my income. Um, what, if I what if I build a cash position for nothing and three years pass and I cannot use my cash? Once again, it's perfectly fine. It's at least better than uh, wasting my money on fancy trips just so I can impress my Facebook friends. <laughs> it's still not that bad of a situation to be in. And, and the, gist of, the gist of it all is kind of this. You put yourself in a situation where you ask yourself, what if I'm wrong? So what if I'm wrong? If I'm wrong, I have assets. Those assets are going to go up in value. And yeah, I'm going to lose purchasing power on the cash I have chosen to hold on to due to what I perceive is an unprecedented situation where I believe I'm going to be rewarded for building a cash position. If I'm wrong, I'm going to be fine nonetheless. So obviously, and this is what I try to teach people in both of my books, maybe not everyone is in the exact same situation. Maybe you'd have exposure to no assets whatsoever. Maybe you're a one-trick pony. Maybe you, have, you only have exposure to one asset class. There are a wide range of situations that you can find yourself in. And the key here is asking yourself if you are essentially robust enough in terms of a strategy. If you only have exposure to one asset class, even if you love it, or especially if you love it, I think you should be asking yourself whether or not you're uh, being a bit of a one-trick pony here.
if you're spreading yourself too thin and diversified in too many directions, that's not good either. The key here, and once again, speaking of our discussion about you know the political system, socialism versus capitalism, expecting other people to fix your problems versus just you know rolling up your sleeves and doing it yourself, I think the key is in the latter. It's assuming responsibility for your decisions, asking yourself what happens if you're wrong, and again, the number one mistake most people make, in my view, is that they're not robust enough. Build on that, and you will not care when disaster strikes. You'll simply deal with it. Yeah, some really great points there, especially the one that, even though it's predicted by a lot of economists that this disaster is coming, um, the actual disaster, the shape it's going to take is very unpredictable. Is it going to be deflation? Is it going to be inflation? You know, um, is real estate going to skyrocket? Is real estate really going to tank? You know what I mean? It's very hard to predict what's actually going to happen. So that's some really good advice um, as far as being robust. I want you to talk, Andre. Um, were you going to add something there? Well, yeah, just one thing about real yes. estate, again, so, so as to basically highlight my way of thinking, you know, people ask me, if I'm building a cash position, why don't I sell real estate? There's a lot of cash in real estate that I can add to my position. And I tell them, in my case, at least, it's because I do not have, and this is from the perspective of an economist, I trade. I even trade highly volatile assets on leverage when the right circumstances present themselves. So I'm no stranger to risk. But I do not have enough confidence in my ability to time it perfectly. And therefore, I choose to build a cash position with, by continuously working, by continuously adding outside capital to the mix. Because you expect a deflationary crash, right? You own a bunch of um, income-producing real estate. Maybe you sell it. Perfect. But as everyone in the space knows, it's not easy. It takes time to find buyers to close the deal, the entire process. What if by the time you do it, so as to, you end up with a bunch of cash, but by the time you end up being able to actually find new deals and uh, use that cash to build a new position in real estate after a deflationary crash, maybe by the time that happens, the crisis already spirals out of control in an inflationary way. And essentially, you expect prices to go down, you sell all your real estate, prices go back down, but you don't use your capital to buy new real estate quickly enough. And in the end, you draw the line and you realize you might have been better off just keeping your real estate altogether. So I hope this kind of outlines my way of thinking and how important it is to bet on your own incompetence. Right. And, and I love that you just consider yourself incompetent. I have no clue. I have no idea. Therefore, I'm preparing for everything. It's, it's, really, it's a really good perspective. Talk to us about the best ways to generate passive income. Well, the best ways to generate passive income, number one, to have realistic expectations as to what passive means. Now, as a professional, I've run, I'm also an entrepreneur, I've run anything from hosting businesses to online brokerage businesses to web development businesses and a wide range of other, of other things. I've played around with anything from digital projects like the aforementioned ones to real estate that I've also mentioned previously. And in my opinion, people uh, you know, tend to be overly optimistic when, uh, when assessing just how passive something is. As someone who invests in real estate and collects income uh, by renting out the properties, is it passive? Well, it, it's kind of passive, but you still have to put in the work. You still have to maintain the properties. You still have to deal with the logistics of it all. The same principle is valid when it comes to everything else. So as always, the key is understanding that there's no such thing as a silver bullet here, something that's guaranteed to generate 100% passive income. I think it's perfectly fine if you just focus on building streams that are passive enough. I think that's perfectly fine. So that's one. Two. It might seem a, a bit weird, but it's not. Yes, I consider myself incompetent, and that gives me the humility it takes to make wise investment choices rather than think I can predict the future. But at the same time, when it comes to building passive income sources or income sources in general, let's say, don't forget to bet on yourself. Don't forget to invest money in yourself. Don't forget to invest money in building new skills that enable you to make a lot more money than you did in the past. One of the main questions I get asked by people is, 
okay, how do I make more money? I, I don't have enough money at my disposal. Or how do you invest a small amount? I think this is the most common question by people in the wealth management field. And more often than not, the key is investing in yourself. It's maybe acquiring a skill that's going to pay dividends each and every month from now on for the rest of your life. So <coughs> that would be my number two piece of advice, bet on yourself. And number three, once again, as someone who ran a wide range of projects and who started way more, there's nothing wrong with losing. My personal win rate across my projects, because I'm someone who, who is not shy about starting a new business, starting a new project and things of that nature, it's well below 50%. Like if you take all of the ideas I had and how many of them were actually transformed in uh, something viable when it comes to income, passive or not, most of them have been epic failures. At one point <laughs> in my career, I thought it was a good idea to launch an auction, an auction platform shaped like an octopus, where an octopus was, was pointing at multiple auctions. It was not a good idea in high school. <laughs> so there's, right. there's, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with failing. You're going to fail. Chances are you're going to fail. I have a problem with investors in general who think, oh, you need to have a win rate of over 50 or X percent to be successful. No, there are plenty of people who can be successful through smart money management and the nature of the choices they make. You can be successful with a 10% win rate. If when you do win those 10%, you milk it for all it's worth and you take it to the bank. So one win is essentially enough to cover a, a, a lot of losses. Let's just say that. So, uh, which, which brings me to, I think, number four, and I'll end it here. Number four would be um, the idea that there's no such thing as, you know, uh, a one-size-fits-all approach. The only benchmark, the only thing you should care about is what your bank account says. Look at your bank account, look at your bank account over an extended period of time, and it's going to tell you whether or not what you're doing is success successful. I assure you that, that a guy who makes, you know, tremendous amounts of money by investing or trading in a way that generates a, a win rate of only 10% doesn't care about the fact that some economists out there roll their eyes when, when they hear about it. The only thing he cares about is that he looks at his bank account and his bank account confirms his strategy. That's the only confirmation you need. So I think broadly speaking, just applying these four things is going to, it's it's certainly going to put you in much better shape than most people. Yes. With respect to building income in general and income that's again not passive but passive enough. Now, Andre, what are some of the best strategies that you have come across for making income online? It's difficult to say because I because I've been involved in just so many things and. I don't think there's an answer to the question. If, if anything, my experience online, you know, personally with my own project would, projects would be that there's more than one way to skin a cat. If I were to give people advice about what to do with their careers, whether it's launch an online business or start a YouTube channel like I've done with One Minute Economics or write books like I've had or anything else, it's try to do something that you like more than your current hobbies. Because that's the key. I've done well with my projects because I'm damn good at them. I'm good at them because I love what I do. I would much rather work or, or read, a, read an economic paper or, or, or do something else pertaining to economics than uh, be involved in what were currently my hobbies. I think that's the key. That's the key to overperforming someone who treats their occupation whether it's an online project or anything else, like, oh, I hate my job. I cannot wait to go just nine to five. I can't wait for it to be five. I can't wait for it to be weekend, to be over with. You're doing it wrong because someone like myself is going to go who loves his work and you cannot compete with that because that person is going to be more than happy to work on weekends. I don't take weekends off because I like what I do. I don't take days off. I don't, I just like what I do and I do it whenever possible without it interfering with my personal life as well. So I, you know, I, uh, if, if there's anything I've learned, it's that. So what if, if, if you can, I don't want to end it before uh, adding a small parenthesis here, however, I was poor, okay, by Eastern European standards. Not only was I poor, but, you know, I started making decent money online as of 15-ish. 
So uh, as a 15-ish, I was making enough for me to say whenever I want to buy something, I can buy it. I'm independent enough. And not only that, I set a ton of money aside for my age. But then, you know, as a bit of a welcome to adulthood present, my mom got sick. It was a pretty serious stuff. I took her to get treatment abroad. And needless to say, I'm a cheap bastard. So I set most of what I made aside. I didn't buy fancy cars. I didn't buy anything. I addressed this in my books as well. But despite being a cheap bastard, despite doing everything, you know, right from a wealth management perspective, you're only one family-related emergency away one medical situation or anything else from losing it all. So back when I was young, I essentially was forced to start over because all the money I had diligently set aside was gone. So that's the nuance I want to add to the discussion. When I had to rebuild from scratch, I did not have the luxury of saying, hmm, I'm only going to do what I want, what I like. No. I did whatever brought home the money, whether it was writing articles or, you know, doing things that I didn't necessarily care too much uh, about when it comes to the topics or anything else. I did what had to be done to rebuild my capital. Once I was financially well off enough, yeah, I was able to say, you know what, with one minute economics, I have, you know, I help students from all over the world. 50% of my traffic comes from students. I love what I do. I help hundreds of thousands of people literally each year. So I don't care if one minute economics generates less revenue and it does than other projects that I could invest my time in. I don't care, but I don't care because I do it from a position of financial strength. It's something I, I don't care because I can afford to do it now, but I didn't afford to do it back then. So that's the, the nuance I want to add to the discussion. Don't judge yourself too much. If you're not in a good position financially, just again, roll up your sleeves, do whatever it takes, the daily grind it takes for you to be financially secure. But please, once you are financially secure, you owe it to yourself. And this, is, this has been my strategy to gradually dedicate less time to the things you hate doing but bring home the bacon and more time to the things you love doing. You don't have to do it in one fell swoop. Just do it one step at a time. And I think that's a pretty coherent framework. It's a great philosophy. It's a great philosophy because so many people, you know, they complain about they don't like this, they don't like that, you know, about what's happening. But just work at what you can make your money. Save your money. Don't be going out buying clothes and going out for drinks and things like that. Save your money to get your nest egg so that you can kickstart yourself into what you want to be doing and then sort of gradually go. I think that's really nice. I think that's the point that most people miss. They complain about what they're doing, but yet they uh, take their spendable um, cash or things that they should be putting aside and they spend it <laughs> exactly. while they complain. It's, it's essentially the difference between working a job you hate because you like the money and that money enables you to go on fancy trips that maybe are too tiring for your personality. I personally don't like to travel all that much. Some people do, it's fine. But the difference between maybe having a job you hate just so you can make money to buy a fancy car and you know go on fancy trips and then impress people who don't actually care about you as opposed to setting that money aside one year, two years, three years, five years, and maybe 10 years from now, being able to embrace a career where you cannot wait to get up in the morning and do your work as opposed to what you did before. If some people choose the former over you know, the latter, that's their prerogative, but I don't think it's logical. Yes. Now, as the last question here, I have to ask this uh, for certain members of my audience. You are coming to us from Romania which um, the center of this country is Transylvania, which, of course, the legend of Dracula was born from. Um, have you ever been to Dracula's castle, and do you put any credence in the legend? Well, strangely enough, I live in Transylvania. I live in the largest city in Transylvania. Yes, I have been to, you know, to uh, Dracula's castle. And with respect to vampires, our policy here in Romania is that we are not allowed to talk about it. So, just, sorry. Really? Oh, wow. Some insight. Just come over here, leave your windows open, and it's, it's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> gotcha. Andre, this has been an amazing interview. Please remind everyone where your YouTube channel is and also how to follow you. 
My YouTube channel is One Minute Economics, and two times each week I publish one minute videos about various economic topics that I think everyone should know about. So by just heading to youtube.com forward slash one minute economics or Googling or searching on YouTube for One Minute Economics. The same way, my website, andrepolgar.com, where you can just Google my name. I'm an easy guy to get a hold of. If there's anything I can be of help with, don't hesitate. If you have you know, something to ask about one of my videos on the channel, just leave a comment. I do my best, you know, the best I can possibly do to, add, to reply to all questions. And yeah, my YouTube channel, my personal website, or just Google my name or the name of the YouTube channel and you're going to find me. Great. Andre, thank you so much for coming on this show today. Thank you very much for having me, Michelle. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you managed to extract a ton of value from watching us. And of course, be careful out there, especially if you're interested in dropping by here in Transylvania. That's right. <laughs> Mr. Andre Polgar, economist, best-selling author, and host of One Minute Economics. For the leaders of tomorrow's show, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.